in a town that I'm sure you've never heard of, Knight's Ferry. But it probably has a distinction of uh, a decision was made here that I think probably profoundly affected the course of our nation and made the difference between the United States being the United States or us having two different countries. Stay tuned, I'm in the town of Knights Ferry, California. Before we tell that story though, which I know you've never heard before and you're gonna love it and you're gonna scratch your head at the end of it and say, wow, some places really are significant. But we've got a place to see here in town, just a little bit away from town, that is an amazing landmark, very unusual uh, for the West. Let's hop back in the car and check it out. Don't worry, we'll be back later. I'll tell the story, I'll tell the story. We'll look around town a little bit too, because we have another, uh, another really cool place I want to show you. First time I came here, I was like, what are all these people uh, doing here? And there were all kinds of people over on the bridge up here. And uh, evidently, they're down here looking at the salmon run. Sure, what they're doing over here. She said the best view is to go up on the uh, bridge, so that's exactly what we're going to do. The hike going up. Getting plenty of exercise on this trip. Definitely salmon in there. Just for context, those bad boys have been swimming, well, it's a hell of a long time. <laughs> From the ocean is about 140 miles west of here, so they're looking a little tired, but it's a journey that must be done. Interesting, too. We have uh, whale watching, and it's the first time I've ever seen salmon watching. Have I caught salmon? Of course. Check out the uh, videos, New Sea Angler. Rosie nailing some, just put salmon in the search box and you'll be able to see it. I might be able to link it up here. Pretty cool, but let's get on to the main event. And up here, I want to give you the whole experience. This was a grinding mill here. Flour and I don't know what all they do, but very old school. 1850s. First flour mill in Knights Ferry. 1862. Look at this magnificent view. But this is what we came for. Right here. What you're looking at is the longest covered bridge west of the Mississippi River. 300 feet.
see that terrain. Whoa, it's Stanislaus River there. You can imagine when that thing is raging. Getting across things, this would be a nightmare. So this bridge, Mr. Knight built himself a nice little money maker here. So much so that the town is named after him. Head on to town. We're looking at the oldest continuously operating general store in California, correct sir? That's it? Yeah, it's right, yep, right there. This monument, store 1852, amazing. You're looking at real history right here. Go inside and take a look. It's got the old pot belly stove in here, which is cool. How are you today? Good, how are you? Good. Oh, here's the, uh, you tell me this is the mark where the flood, flood was of 1955 here. That's how high the water was here. It's a wonder this survived, this door, you know, so. I like this, it's got the old school creaky floors. <laughs> and there's the stove in the back. Look at these old coolers. Old school. And there she is. I can feel the warmth off of the stove crackling away. That's a cheerful oak. Like this. Here's some pictures of how the flood water was in 1955. Terrible. California said it's a dangerous place to live between fires, floods, and earthquakes. One of them is going to get you. Oh, focus. There we go. Real piece of history there. I will return to get something for the road. Right. Guy's very nice. What are you doing back here? It's a cool little town. But the oldest continuously operating general store in the state of California, 1852. Knights Ferry Hotel. Looks like these folks want to sell. Private residence. I'd be afraid to buy here after seeing the flood of 1955. Sat next to it, but... Washington Hotel. Why town? But a town of some real significance. Back in 18, I think 1850s, early 1850s, there was a pretty famous guy you may have heard of him named Ulysses S. Grant. He went on to prominence as the uh, general of the armies and co-commanded the Army of the Potomac with General George C. Meade. But we'll get to that in a minute. What's interesting about General Grant's life is that once the Mexican-American War was over, 1848 and 49, they had a real surplus of officers and things and people were getting out of the army and being let go. He was not a real high-performing uh, person in West Point. I think he was near the uh, lower part of his class. When that war was over, he was pretty lost. 
he didn't know what he was going to do with his life. His wife at the time, Julia, suggested, why don't you go out west and look around, see what's going on out west. They're opening up the frontiers. You've already been in fighting the Mexico and the wars and he thought, you know what? That might be a good idea. And between 1852 and 1854, he visited this area. His wife, Julia's brothers, had quite a bit of success here in the town of Knights Ferry. He came here and visited. He liked it so much the first time that he came back two more times. Julia Grant's brothers twisted his arm and did everything that they could and came very close to uh, persuading him to move to Knights Grant and seek his fortune. Now this is where the story gets really, really interesting and you need to really think about what might have been. Grant, of course, at the end decided to take the uh, sail out of San Francisco, cross in the Panama area, Nicaragua, and make his way... Ooh, I thought that was my phone. Make his way back to the east coast. But one has to stop and wonder what might have been in the world would the United States have stayed united had Ulysses S. Grant not assumed full command of the Army of the Potomac. Let's drill down on this a little bit. Stay with me. When the Civil War began, the Army of the Potomac, which was the main fighting force, Lincoln's army, was charged with the task of suppressing the Confederate rebellion. It was supposed to be an easy matter. 90-day uh, enlistments, it'll be over. It's a war that dragged on about uh, four, over four years. The succession of Union generals during that time was terrible. Started with Pope, and then McClellan, and then Burnside, and then Hooker, and finally General George C. Meade, because none of them could do what Lincoln wanted them to do and that was crush the rebellion and unite the United States one more time. When the Civil War began erupting and rumblings of the Civil War began uh, to stir in the 1850s, Grant went back into the Army. At that time they had a special program to let people back in who had uh, left the Army and Grant took advantage of that life wasn't that great uh, and he was happy to come back into the army. He took up the habit of drinking, smoking a ton of cigars a day, but he had success in the West prosecuting the war against the uh, South. So much so by the time General Meade had finished at Gettysburg, he made a big mistake, General Meade. Lee's army after the Battle of Gettysburg was trapped against the Potomac River due to a torrential rainstorm that had swelled the Potomac River to a point that Lee's army was effectively trapped with no way to get across. Instead of pursuing Lee, Meade decided to make excuses, claim that he had uh, couldn't do it, the roads were muddy, there were too many injuries, there were people were, were just battered after Gettysburg, which is probably true. But Lincoln knew that with uh, Lee trapped against the Potomac River, this was going to be a very rare chance to end the Civil War, have Lee surrender, and effectively that would be the end of Southern big resistance. Well, the river went down. Lee managed to make his crossing back over the uh, Potomac. And Lincoln was furious. He wanted to fire General Meade. Finally, he said, give me a man who can fight. And his Secretary of War, Edward Stanton, said, well, there's a guy out west that's had success. His name is Ulysses S. Grant. But the thing about Grant was, Grant was 
Well, people considered Grant a butcher because he would take large numbers of troops, uh, go against fortifications, and suffer horrendous losses. But when you think about it, when you're pursuing Lee through the south, every time Lee retreats, he's able to dig into a defensive position and you have to lose a lot of troops attacking and forcing him out and moving it on. So Grant got a reputation of being a butcher, but he also got a reputation as somebody who was doggedly going to hang on to Lee and follow Lee wherever he went and with all the determination that he could muster to just pursue Lee relentlessly. There would no, be no more retreating back to the north. Uh, after Gettysburg, it was pursued all the way to Appomattox Courthouse in April in 6, 1865 and Lee's surrender. Now, here's the question for you to ponder and people in general that are buffs of history. Had Ulysses S. Grant made the decision to build his life here in Knight's Ferry, would the United States have had the effective generalship at that time to be able to successfully prosecute the Civil War and bring a divided nation together again? It's really a matter with a lot of thought because generals like General Grant don't come along every day. And I think to myself, the history of America might have been far different if Ulysses S. Grant had decided to start his life here after being serving in the Army, start his life again in Knights Ferry, California. We got one cool postscript, though, that gives some insight into what kind of person Grant was. Grant's wife, Julia, was a real soulmate of Ulysses S. Grant. But she was uh, born with a severe eye problem wherein one of her eyes turned inward and made her effectively look cross-eyed. Well, for a female in the 1840s, 1850s with the birth of photography, you can imagine it's not something you want to have done every day is have photographs of yourself done. And she was very reluctant to uh, be photographed. There's only a few uh, of her, and she appears to be squinty and looking down. But you know, she came to Ulysses S. Grant after a while in their marriage. He said, you know, I could get this probably taken care of with an operation. It might be risky. And Grant said, Julia, I married you for exactly the way that you are. Why would I ever want to change one thing about you? Character in spades. Quite a guy. So he drank a little and he smoked cigars. Sadly, he was to die of uh, throat cancer in later life. But to leave his family some money, he wrote his memoirs, which were highly successful before his death. How different things might have been if uh, Ulysses Grant had been a big hitter in Knightsville. Instead of the in Knights Ferry, instead of the Iron Hammer on the battlefield. Well, this is going to conclude our visit to Knights Ferry. I hope you enjoyed it. The cinematic, the history, just an amazing place to me because how different history would have probably been if one man had made a decision opposite of the way that he did decide. I put it out there, you decide. Let me know in the comments section what you think down below. If you're not subscribed, sub up, hit the bell for all notifications. I'd love to do this kind of uh, what I call unique travel. The what ifs of history. And I hope that you will join me for future adventures and fun on the Variety Channel here. As always, your thumbs up are appreciated. If you'd like to support the channel, I don't have memberships, Patreons, things like that. But donations are happily accepted and gratefully accepted. www.paypal.me backslash Rosie O'Kelly. Link down below. Thanks everybody so much and uh, see you on the next adventure.